Welcome. This is the Cisco CCNA ENSA, also known as the Enterprise Networking Security and Automation Course. This course focuses on the CCNA version 7 curriculum. This is course 3 of 3. Module 3, Network Security Concepts. This is actually one of the thicker PowerPoints. We have current states of cybersecurity, threat actors, malware, common network attacks, IP vulnerabilities, threats, vulnerabilities for TCP U, uh, and UDP, IP services, best practices, and some light cryptography. So we have two, four, six, eight, nine main sections. So let's jump on in. Let's get what we can do it. Again, important part is as we are learning, the core thing here is we're expecting a sandbox environment, the ethical component, we're not doing this illegally, and so forth. So current state of cybersecurity, it is a mess. But there are certain terms we need to understand. Assets, vulnerabilities, threats, exposures, mitigation, and risk. These are key terms. You cannot get very far without a good understanding of them. Assets are assets. They are things that are of value on your network. Vulnerability is a weakness in a system or its design that can be exploited by a threat. Threats are a potential danger to a company's asset, data, or network. Exploit is a mechanism that takes advantage of a vulnerability. Mitigation is a countermeasure. And risk is the likelihood of a threat to be realized or exploited. One thing that we don't really talk about is there's normally a person or an attacker that is trying to do this against a victim. So an attacker is going to try to f uh, find an exploit in a vulnerability on the victim's resource or the victim's machine, for example. When we look at the ability or the vector of an attack, that is basically is how are we getting to our victim? That's the vector or the path of an attack. Sometimes the attackers are called threat actors. Sometimes they're called hackers. Sometimes they're called threat varying terms depending on the books and the reading material. There are two main attack vectors of a victim, internal threat or external threat. Internal threats are going to be something inside the network that is targeting the compromised host or the victim inside the network. An outside the network attack, an external attack, is going to be coming from the outside portion of the network, like the internet, for example. The key thing here is data loss or data exfiltration. This is whether it's on purpose or by accident or it's stolen or just a bad person did it. Data loss can be a huge blow. Companies that typically have data loss don't recover. It's a loss of reputation, loss of revenue or money or customers. It could be a loss of business or competitive advantage. The fun part with all of that is because there are very strict guidelines about personable data or personable identifiable data, there could be legal action. There could be fines of the organization because there was a loss. Significant cost and effort normally is put in the, to prevent the loss. But there's also significant cost and effort to notify uh, the individuals if there's a data breach. Many states have a data breach clause in their laws saying if a organization houses someone's data and that organization has a data breach, they have to identify who data was compromised and notify them in a timely manner. Some of this is also called the data loss prevention controls to prevent data from being lost. 
and this is going to be a combination of strategic, operational, and tactical measures to prevent possible data breaches when possible. So what are these data loss controls? What are these data loss vectors? What are these things that prevent data loss? So main vectors for data loss are email and social networks or social media. They can intercept emails or messages to capture uh, important information. Unencrypted devices, that's going to be USB flash drives, USB hard drives that are lost. Cloud storage when uh, it's compromised or has a weak password. Reboomable media, again, flash drives, hard copies, that's paper, physical copies, and most importantly, improper access controls. I dealt with many organizations that improperly set up their controls so that while they were trying to secure something, they didn't have the proper controls in place, and so things kept getting out. More specifically, they would have uh, administrators put sensitive data on flash drives that were not encrypted and the administrators would lose the flash drive and the exposure of that lost data or that data in general was uh, out there and many times this had occurred and they had lost private information they had lost PII on kids they've lost accounting records just because there wasn't a proper access control or this proper procedure such as making sure any sensitive data leaving on removable media is encrypted. All right, so now let's talk about who's actually doing the attacking. Who are the threat actors? And a threat actor is the next main section. Threat actors are typically those that are doing the negative, but they're not always the negative. We have a umbrella term, hacker. And normally, hackers are broken into three main categories. White, black, and gray. White are the ethical individuals. Black are the unethical or more criminal. Gray hat is a combination in between. Why they do what they do is also equally important. But... The process of how they do it is what identifies them as black hat, gray hat, or white hat. If you are doing it with permission, legally, you're typically a white hat. If you're kind of skating the line of legality, probably a gray hat. If you are definitely crossing that line, then black hat. Other Hacking uh, subgroups might be a script kitty or a hacktivist, uh, a vulnerability broker. You could be a cyber criminal, a state-sponsored uh, individual as well. The big ones are hacktivists, and that's typically gray hats that are activists that they use their hacking skills. Normally for a reason they believe is important, like public protesting. Script kitties are those that are inexperienced, but they understand how to run the tools. They may not understand how, how it all works, but they know it, in order to achieve this task, use this tool, and they have a very limited understanding of how the tools actually function. The big thing is, when we're talking illegal activities, when we're talking the black hat side, Cyber criminals are are there. And it is estimated that realistically cyber criminals are stealing billions, if not trillions of dollars around the world. They are stealing billions from consumers and from businesses again all over the place. And that could be ransomware, zero-day exploits, botnets, banking issues, phone scams, and more. This is just a sad fact of life. Ransomware is growing quick. And businesses pay. They know that 
This is now just an operational cost. Hacktivists are another one. And again, these are groups like Anonymous and uh, other groups that target typically for a government reason or to a protest a government reason. So some of the, the content on the slides you have to take with a grain of salt. Hacktivists tend to rely on fairly basic free available tools. That's kind of garbage. It all depends on the individual. And again, this is more based off of their intent. What, why are they doing this? If they're doing it in form of a protest, then they're a hacktivist. Could a black hat be a cyber criminal and a hacktivist? Sure. What are they doing and what is their intent? That dictates the type of threat actor they are. Next is state-sponsored hackers. These are funded by government and they are very typically advanced. They have custom tools, they have sophisticated tools, and they are pretty involved. Stusnex malware was created by hacktivist or a, a state-sponsored group to target another country. That's not a hacktivist because that's not a protest. That is sabotage or espionage. So again, the reasoning or the intent behind why they're doing it is important. Threat actor tools. In our course shell, there is a video covering types of attacks and pin tools. Common attack tools that we're using to exploit a vulnerability. The attacker has to have the technique or the tool or the experience to do certain things. There is a specific process like reconnaissance or network uh, scanning. If we're talking password cracking, they're going to have password cracking tools. If they're doing wireless hacking, they'll have wireless hacking tools and so forth. All right, so let's look at some of those tools. Password cracking tools, these are tools for cracking passwords, like John the Ripper or uh, Lothcrack or TH uh, THC Hydra. Rainbow cracks, things like that. They will use uh, an algorithm to try to crack a password, repeatedly guessing at the password. There are also rainbow tables that are looking up the hashes of passwords. That way we can identify the password via its hash instead. We also have wireless tools. That's going to be aircrack, ng. There's also Kesmit or other versions, but realistically, Aircrack is probably the most common wireless hacking tool. Uh, network scanning and hacking tools, that's going to be InMap, uh, by far. InMap's the big one. Packet crafting tool is like Netcat, NPing, um, Packet, Scappy, HPing. All of these are crafting tools for our packets. There's also sniffers out there like Wireshark. TCP dump, or Fiddler, and more. Other pin tools are like rootkit detectors. That's going to be things like uh, aid or net filter. For our fuzzy and our search vulnerabilities, some of these are, are really old. So like Skipfish, uh, Mwapiti, and our W3AF. Again, these are fairly uh, older tools. They are still used for searching for vulnerabilities. They're just not the most current. Forensics tools could be Multigo, Encase, uh, SleuthKit. In reality, SleuthKit is going to be Autopsy or FTK Access or Access FTK or Paladin. Those are all pretty common forensics tools. Debuggers are going to be like WinDB or IDA Pro. IDA Pro is going to be one of the big ones because IDA Pro is also used for malware analysis. Hacking OSs are going to be things like Kali or Blackbox or Parrot. Encryption tools are going to be like OpenSSH, OpenSSL, uh, OpenVPN, which is not really an encryption tool. It's more of a, a VPN application, but... Uh, Verisite, Cypher Shred, all their encryption based tools, vulnerability exploitation type tools, social engineering toolkit, SQL map, 
those are the big two. Uh, Metasploit is probably the, the largest, and that's going to be the toolkit for exploiting vulnerabilities. Vulnerability scanners are going to be things like Nessus, but that's expensive. So a lot of people try the open source version, which will be OpenVos. But if you've ever played with OpenVos, you realize how complicated it is and how much time it takes to set up, and that just becomes a much larger headache. So now that we've talked about tools, let's talk about attack types. We have numerous types of attacks, and this is just a small sliver of them. Sniffer attacks, that's where we're sniffing applications or devices to uh, capture data. We have a compromised key attack. That's going to be looking at and targeting access based off of a cryptography key. Man in the middle, that's going to occur when the threat actor has a ability to position themselves between a source and destination and capture traffic between both source and destination. A denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack or DDoS is a type of an attack where you consume resources of a target system. Uh, pinging one or two, not a big deal. You get a thousand people to ping a target that will start consuming resources. Now, amplify that by two or three or four. Now you have tens of thousands of people targeting a victim. That's a denial of service attack. Password based attacks are looking at valid user accounts and trying to capture or break their passwords. We have spoofing attacks and data modification attacks. All of these are different types of attacks to do something. Uh, construct a invalid packet or maybe construct a packet to jump VLANs or eavesdrop or listen or spoof traffic. The big thing is all of this funnels into malicious code or malware. So keep in mind that when we're talking malware, we're talking a high level overview. We're not getting nitty gritty into malware. That way expectations are kind of kept realistic. When we understand vulnerabilities, we understand how to target those vulnerabilities. We need to understand the different types of malicious code that can be used to access devices. Sometimes a web browser can be the malicious code. That just means how we're using our technology to target our victims. And what I mean by that is sometimes a web browser or even a, a Gmail account, for example, could be the tool the attacker uses to target a machine or to use a command and control server through a Gmail account or things like that. The normal vulnerabilities for end users are viruses, worms, trojans, and things like that. Those are the big ones. However, ransomware and otherware, scareware, bloatware are also very common as well. But those are specialty and kind of outside the scope of our class. Viruses and trojan horses are probably the, the most common type of malware, viruses. They can alter, corrupt, delete, do whatever they're programmed to do. Could cause booting issues or corruption issues, could capture insensitive information, could capture uh, keystrokes. It could be a charging cable for your phone, depending on the cable that you have. OMG cables are out now, so definitely could be that. Uh, they can access and use email accounts and they can spread themselves. They can lay dormant until a CNC or command and control server says activate and do this. Some common viruses are things like a firmware virus or a boot sector virus. These are things that, are, that will hide in the boot sector or the firmware. There's macro viruses that hide in the macro features of like Office, for example. There are script viruses, there are programmed viruses, and they hide themselves in executables or they kind of embed themselves in other applications to wait for the app, main application to run before the malicious code is then ran. All right, so now that we talked about viruses, let's talk about Trojan because 
just like viruses, there's tons of different types of Trojans. There's FTP Trojans, there's Proxy Trojans, there are Destructive Trojans, there are Banking Trojans, there are Remote Access Trojans, that's probably the most common type of Trojan. But again, this is just a very small list of a big list of Trojans. We have malware types, adware, ransomware, rootkit, spyware. We have bloatware, we have scareware, we have worms, and more. Again, this is not a complete list at all. This is a small little segment of the type of malware that's actually out there. The amount of malware out there is just growing. By far, probably the most more realistic scary ones are going to be ransomware rootkits and worms ransomware by far is growing because it yields money they're seeing an increase of ransomware attacks because again it it's easy and it yields money moving forward we have common network attacks so these are the attacks that are going to be more susceptible to attacks. Normally, common network attacks are going to be like denial of service attacks or DDoS attacks or DOS attacks, access based attacks, as well as sniffing and reconnaissance based attacks. There is a video in our course shell covering the common types of attacks, but again, this is pretty self explanatory of how these are and how they function after you complete the reading and the lab. A reconnaissance attack is just a way to gather recon or reconnaissance. They gather information. That could be as quickly as doing an in-map scan or as simple as an in-map scan. You will gather information about your target by doing some basic recon. And normally there are different techniques it could be a ping, it could be a vulnerability scan, it could be an exploit tool like a Metasploit or the set tool. It could be as simple as doing some open source intelligence gathering like Google searching or Google dorking. That's all passive. Or it could be more active reconnaissance like scanning the network, in mapping their network or running vulnerability software against the network. There are some videos in the course shell about the techniques used for password attacks or other techniques. And we keep saying things like access based attacks, but they didn't really organize this quite well. Access based attacks or password attacks or spoofing attacks or port redirections or man in the middle based attacks. We also have our social engineering based attacks. These are going to be social engineering tools that are used in conjunction with access attacks to attempt to manipulate individuals into performing a se uh, sequence. A spear phishing email, for example, could be a targeted email with the hopes of the victim clicking on a link, thus allowing the attacker to gain access to the victim's system and that could be a social engineering based attack again common social engineering attacks are using like phishing or spear phishing or spam tailgating is a big one tailgating in is when you follow an authorized person in quickly behind them before like, the door closes for example dumpster diving looking through their garbage or shoulder surfing that's where the threat actor looks over someone's shoulder to steal content off their screen or possibly their passwords. Spam is also classified as a social engineering attack. Even though this is more junk mail, this might have harmful links or malware or deceptive contents. My favorite is my Amazon account is locked and it's coming from Joe Blow at azn.com. And it's like, okay, that's not Amazon but I get tons of them. Again, a social engineering attack, I uh, will use the set toolkits. And normally this is where user awareness comes into play. 
things like locking your system when you leave, never reusing passwords or related passwords, don't be releasing work information on social media sites. This may seem pretty standard, but you'll be surprised how many people do this. Using uh, username and passwords that are left on a sticky note on a system or giving your username and password to someone. Uh, always destroying confidential information per policy. Having policies that say to do certain things. We do have labs on social engineering. We do have a video on our DDoS and DOS based attacks. Again, DOS and DDoS is overwhelming a target based off of having a larger quantity of traffic target them. A DDoS is a distributed version of that. That way, instead of having one system target, we can have multiple systems target a victim. And that can also be done with maliciously formatted packets to overwhelm the victim's system. Next major section is vulnerability and threats. There is a video looking at our the techniques for ICMP based attacks, amplification attacks, reflection attacks in our course shell. So we're not going to go over those uh, in depth. IPv4 and IPv6 based threats. That could be again ICMP attacks. That's where someone will use an echo packet or ping to discover subnets. We have application and reflection based attacks. That's normally where we're going to be using uh, a DOS attack to attempt to prevent legitimate users from accessing information. Spoofing, that's where we're going to be spoofing our layer 3 data. Man in the middle attacks, these are threat actor positioning themselves between the source and destination, thus controlling the flow of communication to and from. And session hijacking is where you gain access to a network access or a session so that you can steal information. ICMP attacks, again, that's either ICMP v4, or ICMP v6, and that is where you're going to be using the ICMP for reconnaissance and scanning access. And again, this is where you restrict ICMP access via an ACL or an IDS or IPS to prevent access or to prevent information from being gained, but that is not as realistic as people seem. We have echo request and echo reply. We have ICMP unreachable. That's where the network reporting reconnaissance and attacks are using ICMP messages that are not being able to be reached. We have a mask relay, and that's mapping the internal network. Redirects, and that is normally used by man in the middle based attacks. And then we have ICMP router discovery, and that is where we inject bogus routes in the route table of uh, unsuspecting victims. Again, we have a video looking at amplification, reflection, and spoofing based attacks. But essentially, we have a threat actor that will use their botnet to target a victim. And this is more of an amplification and reflection. The threat actor will use amplification techniques to perform a DDoS attack or other form of attack to overwhelm the targets. Address spoofing is looking at either non-binding or blinding spoofing, and that will be the threat actor will use the traffic that's sent between hosts and the target. In a non-binding attack, the spoofing will determine the state of a firewall and sequence number to inject authorized sessions. With blind spoofing, they do not worry about the sequence number or the state of the firewall. They just inject data and blindly hope that it goes through. Next main section is about TCP and UDP vulnerabilities. So we already know that TCP and UDP are the layer 4 data header or the layer 4 segments. 
The big thing is they have their own headers. And a lot of people don't realize that. So when we're looking at a TCP header, we know that because when we look at this header specifically, sequence number and acknowledgement number, right there immediately you know that's a TCP header because UDP does not have either of those. Anyways, looking at the header, we're looking at the control bits. Are they a urgent? Is it an acknowledgement? Is it a push or a reset or a sync or a fin? All of that is controlled in the control bit section. That means we can look at how to manipulate those control bits to determine how this header is going to do things. If we are looking at a TCP uh, functionality, we're looking at flow control, stateful communication, reliable uh, delivery because TCP does the handshake, the sync, sync ack, or the, uh, the, the sync, sync ack acknowledgement section. That through a handshake allows for communication. Well, that can also be a way to target a vulnerability. Here we have a sync flood attack. And what we do is from the victim or potential attacker, we can target a web server. The attacker will craft the packet so that when the web server responds, they target a valid machine. And so we start opening these communication pathways when there isn't an actual web server. We manipulate the data on our packets so that we could target our victims. We have these session states that are open, but they go nowhere. Here we have the termination process for TCP. We have a fin, ack, fin, ack. And that allows us to tear down our communication. But there are ways to uh, hijack these sessions before they're properly terminated. So here is a UDP header. You'll notice it is way simpler than our TCP. There is no acknowledgement. There is no sequencing. It is basically source and destination ports, length, checksum, and that's it. This is often used by DNS, SMTP, TFTP, and other things that need speed or have a real-time component. UDP flood attacks is basically where the threat actor will use a tool like UDP Unicorn or low orbit ion cannon and they will flood the network with UDP packets. Let's look at other IP services, things like ARP. ARP is very vulnerable to attack. Here we have an ARP request because there is a broadcast for finding out the layer 2 data of a layer 3 address. So any client can rescind or could send that ARP response and there could be unsolicited ARP replies when we're trying to get legitimate network traffic to find the layer 2 address of a layer 3 device. Well, there could be cache poisoning there could be poisoning of the ARP table. There could be reverse uh, poisoning. There could be active and passive types of poisoning. And again, that's just where we're, tr we're trying to get things to respond that have a specific IP address, but you have a threat actor respond with bogus data to fill the cache. And that would then poison that cache. There is a video looking through it as well in our lecture. Moving on, we have our DNS based attacks. And that is where we have a DNS relay or we have a resolver attack or a tunneling attack or shadowing attack. And basically where we're targeting DNS so they cannot provide the name resolution. DNS cache poisoning is very common. 
And again, that is where you spoof or falsify the resource records for information on a DNS resolver to redirect it to a legitimate site, to a malicious site. So if you're targeting the revolver, you may have google.com, instead of translating it to Google's actual IP address, you have it translate to a malicious site and thus being able to use that to capture data. But there's also stealth-based techniques like a fast flux, and that's where the threat actor will use this technique to hide their phishing and malware delivery sites behind a quickly changing network of compromised DNS hosts. Uh, there are double IP flux, and again, that's the technique rapidly changing host names, IP addresses, so that the security mechanisms in place in a network are more difficult to detect this type of an attack or a domain generation algorithm and that's where the threat actor will use this technique in malware to randomly generate domain names that can be used as a rendezvous point for their cnc based servers again shadowing attacks are where dns domain shadowing will involve the threat actor gathering the domain account credentials in order to silently create multiple subdomains to be used in the attack. That is still using a DNS server to create multiple subdomains and share those subdomains with other DNS servers so that the security appliances do not see the subdomains as uh, threats, for example. Tunneling is where the threat actor will use DNS tunneling and they'll place non-DNS traffic within the DNS traffic to obfuscate the data flow. When a security appliance sees things on port 53, they assume, oh, DNS traffic, but that doesn't necessarily mean it really is. There is a way to tunnel traffic through this DNS uh, platform. So. Uh, examples might be a CNC server sent to a botnet. The seven main steps are the command data is split into multiple encoded chunks. The chunk is placed in the lower level domain name label of the DNS query. Because there's no response from the local or network DNS for the query, the request is sent to the ISP. Recursive DNS then occurs. The recursive DNS service will forward the query to the threat actor's uh, name server. The process is repeated until all queries containing the chunks of data are sent. When the threat actor is receiving the DNS queries from the infected devices, it will send response to each DNS query. And then the malware on the compromised host machines, we combine all the chunks of data to execute the command. All right, so we also have DHCP attacks. And again, this is going to be following the door process we can use uh, Dora against itself to spoof data. Some common DHCP attacks are spoofing, uh, modifying or incorrect configuration data, wrong default gateway, wrong DNS server, wrong IP addresses, uh, wrong addresses ha uh, handed out could be black holing traffic. So assuming that the threat actor has successfully connected to a rogue DHCP server to a network, it could then hand out IP addresses for the wrong portion of the network. Again, black holing traffic. We do have a lab looking at capturing DNS traffic and exploring DNS traffic. Not quite sure why this slide was placed after DHCP, but it was. The next main section is security best practices, and that is understanding CIA, confidentiality, integrity, availability, and understanding how this plays in the network. We also have a DID approach, or Defense in Depth, DID. And that means we have multiple appliances in our network as part of the security architecture. VPNs, firewalls, IPSs, IDSs, things scanning for email or web services, AAA services, Active Directory, uh, strong passwords, administrative controls, and so forth. Firewalls prevent things that are not allowed from going into the network. IPSs or IDSs are a way to prevent intrusions. This an, uh, IPS is intrusion prevention system. IDS is intrusion detection system. IPSs are pretty active. They can do something. 
IDSs normally just monitor. An IPS, when a packet comes in, the IPS can actually drop a packet, could alert someone, could send a log, can do something. We have our ESAs and WSAs. That's an email security appliance or a web security appliance. That's going to be handling our filtering. Last main topic is cryptography. There is a video in our lecture or our, our, in our course about cryptography. Cryptography has four key elements for secure communication. Data integrity, uh, original authenticity, data confidentiality, and data non-repudiation. Integrity guarantees that the data wasn't altered in transit. Original authenticity, there is a guarantee level of trust that the person sending the message is the one that actually sent the message. There's also a hash message authentication code or HMAC that can provide a certain level of authenticity trust. Data confidentiality, basically only those authorized to see the message, sees the message. Non-repudiation basically means there's a guarantee that the sender cannot repudiate or refute the validity of the message, meaning the sender cannot say, I didn't send that. They can't refute it. There is a mechanism that places that the sender actually is the one that sent the message. Data integrity, again, making sure that the message that was sent is the message that was received. There is no modification, the pay or the pay person or anything was modified. Hashing functions like MD5 or SHA verify the authenticity of that message, meaning it knows the message was sent, this is a message that was received. And these are just two of the well-known hash functions, not the only one. Since talking authenticity, this will guarantee that the person sending the message was really the person who sent the message. And we can do that through a hashing met or algorithm as well. Data confidentiality is a form of encryption verifying that only those that are authorized to read the message can read the message. The two main forms of encryption are symmetric or asymmetric. Symmetric is the same key for encryption and decryption. Asymmetric is one key for encrypting, one key for decrypting. So again, same key for encrypting and decrypting. That's called a pre-shared key. We have things like DES or triple DES. Those are all older. AES is probably the strongest symmetric and that comes in multiple bit uh, blocks, 128, 192, or 256 key blocks. And that allows us to chunk the data in 228 bit blocks, 192 bit blocks, or 256 bit blocks. And those are the big two. There's also SIL and RC, but AES is probably the strongest. Asymmetric encryption means one public key and one private key. There is a matching pair, one for encrypting, one for decrypting. And again, the bit length can be uh, 512 bytes or bits to 4,000 plus bits. Moving past that, we have our ex key exchange because there is a private key and a public key, there has to be a, some way to disseminate those keys. There is Ike, the Internet Key Exchange, and this is a fundamental portion of VPNs. We have SSL, that's used for securing our web-based certificates. We have SSH, that's for remote access, and we have PGP, and that is for email encryption. Since we're talking VPNs, we have different key lengths. We have a Del Hyphy or DH. And again, that could be 512, 1024, 2048, 4096, and so forth. 
we have our DSS and DSA based keys, and those are for digital signatures. We have RSA, that's probably the strongest asymmetric enc uh, encryption at the moment. And this is for uh, encrypting algorithm for public key infrastructure. And we also have our electrical curve. DH is asymmetric mathematical algorithm and is heavily used in VPN and SSL technologies. Basically, the Hel uh, uh, <laughs> Diffie Hellman basically allows us to have a way to look at the simplifying of DH key argument. Basically, within a DH key exchange, beginning with basically Alice and Bob. We agree on a certain color, we can then add a secret color, and from there we get a private color or a combination of the agreed color and our secret. From there, we can figure out our private colors and looking at our secret color messages, we can be able to decipher what the final color should be. And I have a better message on our DH key exchange and cryptography in a separate video that kind of breaks us down a little bit easier to understand. And that is the end of this chapter. We have multiple packet tracer labs and multiple labs covering all of this material. We talked about network security breaches, attack vectors, attack tools, uh, attack types for malware, IP techniques, IP services. We looked at threats using ICMP as well as TCP and UDP and how to use IP services like DNS and DHCP for attacks. We looked at our firewalls and other security appliances, email and uh, web-based security, and then we wrapped it up with our encrypt, uh, encryption and cryptography-based technologies, looking at hashing, looking at our main hash keys, MD5 and SHA, looking at symmetric and asymmetric keys, and that is it for this chapter. All right, so that does it for this lab video. A few suggestions would be, one, run through the lab a second time, trying to do it by yourself. Two, I would do a summary of kind of what you learned, where you struggled, and keep that type of journal going so that you can build off of it. Third, and finally, take time to reflect. These labs start off fairly easy and then they grow in complexity, so some of the labs you may have to redo a few times to fully grasp what's going on. If you have any questions or any concerns, please feel free to reach out. Thank you.